Tim, thanks very much for uh, making it to the Seismic office here My and uh, having a Q&A with, uh, with us. I'm, I'm one of, I mean, I don't know about that, but I'm, I'm such a fan. Well, I'm a fan of uh, Seismic as well. That's why I, I'm happy to be at the offices. I've uh, read your book and then I've taken tons of notes. So here, you know, like there are many notes, uh, which are all from the four hour work week book. If you don't believe me, it's here. <laughs> and these are quotes and so on. So I'm, I, I know you're like tired about talking about it <laughs> because it's old already. When, when did you write it? Uh, April 2009 was the publication date. So I started writing it about a year before that. Can we like get your, uh, your pitch, like, 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 what's like? People know you from the book, mm -hmm. but what's what's like your uh, your uh, your bio? Yeah, so my bio would be, um, I am a metrics-driven entrepreneur, and uh, guest lecturer at Princeton in high-tech entrepreneurship twice a year. It's not a full-time job, uh, but uh, translate that into angel investing here. I started a company in two thousand one. Uh, in sports nutrition that I just sold this past January, yeah. which very very few people know. I just take this closer so that yep. I can hear you better. Yep, no problem. So yep. I was just saying, um, uh, sold a company I started in 2001, yep. uh, just this past January, which was very interesting. Had uh, some elements of uh, currency arbitrage and things like that. But uh, these days I spend my time with entrepreneurs, uh, advising startups in the valley mostly, and writing, since I enjoy both. So you and you're, you're preparing a new book too. I am. That's top secret. For oh, now. that's top secret. But it's not going to have anything to do with work. <laughs> it will have a lot to do with metrics, though. Okay. Uh, cool. So let's. Uh, I, I think people would. I would love to know how. What do you consider is the best to start a business? How to start a business? <clears throat> how does Tim Ferriss start a business? Right. So, the in my opinion, and this is this similar to Seth in the sense that uh, the direction is slightly different, but I think it's very important to choose your market before you choose your product. Uh, because ultimately your cost per acquisition for the customer and the lifetime value of that customer will determine the economics and whether they work or not. So uh, for me personally, uh, I like to try to scratch my own itch, uh, and that is also what Ev at Twitter has done, certainly what, J what Jack did there. Uh, so, so start with a very small niche? Yeah, so for example, um, Ev at Twitter, and this is true with a lot of successful entrepreneurs in the Valley, they say, God, you know, I would really just like a tool for this, for expressing myself, for really brief snippets of status updates or whatever it might be. And then they build that tool effectively for themselves, yep. recognizing that if, if you're guessing at the size of a market, you might not have any customers. But if, if you're building something for yourself, at least you have one successful <laughs> user case. OK. And uh, from that point, I think it, it becomes so a matter So take yourself as a target. Yeah, take yourself as a target. Mm -hmm. Because you'll know how to develop the value proposition for that market, at least. And uh, from that point, it becomes a matter of testing. So uh, whether that's with book titles. In the case uh, of my book, I tested the book titles and subtitles on Google AdWords. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I had a multivariate test running for one week for about $150. Uh, but uh, that would also entail looking at different types of price points and so forth. And you don't need to actually be manufacturing product or selling a service in order to do that testing. Uh, and it, it's really a matter of determining which metrics matter and then measuring those from the very beginning. And so are you one of those entrepreneurs who uh, uh, likes to launch very early with a product which is not finished? Um, and get as much feedback as you can, or are you, the other school is more like you do it in secret, and you, you test, you do market research, you do everything in secret, and you launch when you consider it's, it's really good. So I think that you can do both, actually. So I think that it's possible to get that early feedback, which is critical, without making it uh, public, in the sense that you can work even with a small group of friends, which is what I did um, with the book, but also with uh, some of the startups that I'm working with, uh, get feedback from people who represent different demographics, uh, then incorporate that into the beta when you when you make it open. Uh, but I generally believe in in fast sprints. So let's just say two week development sprints, and uh, so that uh, might combine with agile uh, development. But do two week sprints, push something out, get feedback, take a brief rest, do another sprint, get a few features out, wait, get feedback. Uh, and uh, Google also does this on a fairly large scale. So when they launched Google News, for example, they were wondering whether they should sort by uh, location or date. Uh, and there were a few other variables. 
and they decided that they would push it out and simply see how many requests and complaints they got related to each of those features. And almost no one asked for location. Mm. Uh, most of them asked for date. So that's the feature that they built into it in the next iteration. So I believe in, in micro-testing. Uh, I'd say that's generally my approach. And, and, and so you don't want a team, right? Uh, I, <laughs> I've read your book. No, no, no. So I think, I think having a team is fine, but the objective isn't increasing headcount. So the objective of a business, uh, there can be many, but in simplest terms is to provide a product or service of value and generate a profit and to keep a very close eye on those numbers. And uh, that is often in the world of venture capital, especially when entrepreneurs have pressure from their investors uh, to add headcount, uh, people lose sight of that. And uh, you can build a team, but in my case, so for example, with the, the company that I founded in 2001, I ended up with between 200 and 300 contracted employees. So is that a team? It's pretty 300 contracted employees? Yeah. So it's a How do you manage that? So uh, the, the secret and, is And all around the world, I guess, I right? Don't, yeah, all over the world. So the, the products were distributed in about 15 countries. Um, and I had five or six uh, managers who were responsible for different areas. So let's say customer service, fulfillment, uh, quality assurance, uh, product sourcing, and they had a very high threshold for independent decision making. So basically, at one point, I was doing something like 60 hours of customer service a week, which was just, uh, but it wasn't from customers. It was from managers asking how they should handle specific cases. So I just said, look, for anything that costs less than $100, you make the decisions. I don't want to hear about it. The customer is your customer, not me. And immediately, raised that bar. I was looking at the financials. First, they would log their decisions and then send me an Excel spreadsheet, first on a weekly basis, then on a monthly basis. And uh, I was able to cut down to less than two hours a week because now they had the freedom to make decisions on their own rather than me building a manual that could never cover all the use cases. Do you have a, uh, also, like, in, in your book, there is a... Uh, hey, Zach, can you be quiet? <laughs> That's how you manage the company here. <laughs> I'm just kidding, obviously. <laughs> um, and so uh, there is one point as well in your, in your book where, uh, where you say that you actually selected your customers in a way. Mm -hmm. You also said at one point, I don't want the boring customers anymore. Right. Yeah. You fired customers. Right. That's right. amazing. It, it's, it's very counterintuitive. And I had suffered with the consequences of adopting the customers always write belief for a very long time. And the fact of the matter is that a, a very important part of your business is selecting who your ideal customer is. And that ideal customer, in most cases, is someone who is extremely high profit and very low maintenance. All right, And that's one of the benefits to having a premium priced product, Right, is that self-select. But if you don't do that, in my case, I had, uh, there were about 120 wholesale uh, customers or distributors. And when I did an 80-20 analysis of the income being generated by the cu those customers, about five, uh, actually eight of them were generating more than 90% of the profit. And then of those eight, there were two who were effectively professional ball breakers. I mean, they were just very difficult. <laughs> very, Can you define a professional yeah, ball, so breaker? ball breaker? Ball breaker is a scientific term. Definition, right. professional <laughs> ball breaker by Tim Ferriss. Right. Uh, <laughs> people who are extremely abusive and just have problems in their own lives that they like to uh, turn into uh, abusive conversations and relationships. Uh, and I took that as a cost of doing business. Uh, and r I recognized at a later point how much that carried over to my personal life, how much that resulted in uh, decreased self-worth in my own eyes. And uh, so we sent out a, a letter to all these customers saying these, just as an update, these are a number of our new corporate policies having to do with how orders should be placed, types of contact. And uh, if you have any trouble adopting these new policies, let us know, and we'll be happy to suggest a new provider. And so it's like go to hell, basically, they, well, politely. Well, politely. politely, because we would have people who would send orders to the wrong people in the wrong format. And that would delay, of course, the delivery. And then they would call us to rant and rave and, uh, and abuse uh, the people that I was responsible for. And that, that was just, at, some, at one point, unacceptable. But a few case studies, uh, I mean, Steve Jobs, does not believe that the customer knows what they want necessarily. Um, yeah, that's how yeah. he came, you know, with his iPhone, right? Yeah, exactly. Can you show me your phone? <laughs> so my phone, the, I, I will break down at some point and buy an iPhone. This is um, <laughs> this is the LG chocolate. Uh, I will come back to why that's important. Right. 
<laughs> Keep going. I try to depend on creating an ideal environment for being productive rather than depending on my self-discipline. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about but that. We'll talk about we'll that. Talk about um, Henry Ford also. Uh, I mean, you can have any color as long as it's black. But on a on a uh, but on a, a very base level, the point he made was that if you ask customers what they want, uh, they'll tell you a faster horse and not a car. Um, so there, there's a lot of room for experimentation. So but you don't. So you don't like. That's very interesting. You don't also believe in all the uh, crowdsourcing, listen to a consumer. You're saying the consumer doesn't know, the, the user doesn't know what he wants. Well, no, this is, so this is a really important question because it's not an either or proposition. I think that, that there are things that the customer can provide or the user can provide very valuable feedback on that you won't see because you're too close to your product. Right. So you could use, um, you could use any number of methods for determining that. You could have a, a feature suggestion uh, on the right-hand side of your page, like Rescue Time does, which is uh, one of the companies I'm invested in. And then that can be ranked, just like on Dig or on Reddit, by those same users to right. determine which have the highest priority. On the other hand, if someone doesn't tell you we need this type of product, you should still feel free to experiment and propose options that the customer has not proposed. So don't become 100% dependent on that crowdsourcing. I but think. like, what do you think of the current Facebook kind of debate where you have, on the one hand, Facebook who changed completely its own page. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, so a lot of angry users, yep. a lot of happy users, right. uh, a huge controversy where someone like Mike Arrington says, uh, TechCrunch says, if you like, don't listen to your users, right. if you listen to your users, you get vanilla. I'm quoting him right, I think. <laughs> and like Scoble also said, if you if you if Porsche was listening to its users, they right. would get a Volvo because you want right. a larger trunk. And right, exactly. No, so I think that I think that both are right, but it's very easy to get into an emotional debate about that, and it becomes philosophical, which is fine if you want. If it's understood at the beginning, it's a philosophical debate. Um, but what I would say is, is as long as Facebook has decided what their most important numbers are, right? Whether that's increased adoption rate, whether that's page views whether that's referrals or some type of uh, adoption of Facebook Connect, as long as wa they're watching those numbers and what they do improves those numbers, then they're making the right decisions based on the framework that, they, that they've created. Uh, so you would, you would pay attention to numbers more than to the online expression of the users. And most of the ones who express themselves are uh, angry. Well, that's the thing, is that the, the minority who tend to be the loudest are always those people who are upset. You want to listen to those people if it's constructive criticism, but you don't want to go into the discussion without a clear idea of what your priorities are. Mm. And uh, there's actually, uh, I was speaking with one of the, the a, a, a person who's very high up at Microsoft. I mean, we're responsible for multiple continents. And uh, their father-in-law is a, is a billionaire. And um, he told me a story about how the two of them were going up a, a, a chairlift at a ski resort for a family retreat. And the billionaire said to this Microsoft manager, you know, I'm really glad you're here with us because you're making me look really good. And uh, he said, well, why is that? He said, well, you're always checking your email. You're working all the time. So my <laughs> wife gives me less grief. And uh, so the, the Microsoft manager uh, said to him, well, I can only imagine how crazy your email must be. And, uh, and uh, his father-in-law said, no, it's not crazy at all because I realized a few years ago that email is everyone else's agenda for my time. So if you go into the inbox without a clear idea of what it is that you need to do for your day, you will just become confused and pulled in a hundred different directions. And I think that crowdsourcing is very similar to that. You have to have a, you have to have a, a list of the fundamental priorities and features that define your company so that it doesn't become a Frankenstein's monster based on the feedback of hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, I think that's very, very important. And only listening to ones who are angry. Can we do a break on the... Yeah. How to manage email according to Tim Ferriss? Yes. So email, there are a few things. Email is a repetitive task. Uh, there are a few different, I think, cornerstone behaviors that help you to manage email. And a big part of managing email is just reducing the anxiety and negative emotional response that you have to email. So number one is with any repetitive task, you want to, ba you want to batch those tasks at certain times so that you're not constantly self-interrupting -inter because the cost is so huge. Uh, there's been research done at Morgan Stanley and other places that show if you to 40% of the time you never complete the task that was interrupted. So 
Um, there are tools you can use for that. Um, Zobni, for example, for Outlook will help you to determine what your hot spots are during the day. So maybe that means that it's most effective for you to check and respond to email at 10, 2, and 4 p.m. Mm -hmm. and uh, people can then contact you via cell phone for anything urgent. That's very important. And that is one of the hardest rules for people to follow themselves. Uh, number two is recognizing that, and this is from, from Robert Scoble, uh, the more email you send, the more email you're going to receive. So that also means the more email you respond to, the more email you're going to receive. So for every email you send, uh, at least from Robert's standpoint, you get 1.75 to 2 email in response. So you can see how that doesn't scale. If you respond to everything and continue to send more email, you will, you will continually have more email than you can respond to. And at some point, that, that approach to managing email breaks down. Um, you check it also twice a day only? Uh, I you check. don't give the expectation to people that they should get an answer from you from your phone, like a BlackBerry or an iPhone. Right? I don't. So that's part of the reason I don't have a BlackBerry. Uh, but I want people to know the rules of engagement. And there are many people who say, well, you know, I'm, a, I'm an employee. I can't do that. My boss would fire me. Uh, that is an assumption, and I'm not saying that that wouldn't happen, mm. but you need to test your assumptions. So if your system isn't working, or if you have a certain type of, let's say, email management, ask yourself the question, if I win the game that I'm playing, if I get twice as many customers, if that results in twice as many email, twice as many voicemail, does my system scale? And if it doesn't scale, when are you going to, when are you going to address that and replace it with a better system? And uh, one one particular example that jumps to mind was I was at South by Southwest, and this, uh, the manager of a radio station in Austin came up to me and said, you know, I'd love to batch my email, but it's impossible. My, I would get fired. This is the busiest week of the year. And I encouraged him to, to test that assumption because I, he was completely overwhelmed. It was affecting his personal life. And um, he forwarded me the response from his boss. And the response was, awesome time management approach exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point, all in caps. I wish more people would use this type of autoresponder. And then he CC'd the managers of five radio stations. Because as bad as email might be for you, it's even worse for your boss, generally speaking. Because they get CC'd by, BCC'd by everybody who wants to cover their asses. Um, Chris Saka has a very good quote, which is, uh, uh, an email, your email box is a to-do list that someone else decides. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly right. And that doesn't mean that you are rude about it. But you need, in, in a world where there is instant access and anyone can communicate with you if your contact information is out there, you have to recognize that the, the surest way to, there's no one path to productivity. Everybody has a different personality profile, different priorities. But the one way to be completely unproductive is to try to make everybody happy. That is. Which is the same for a business, your cult, right? Yeah, absolutely. That is the surefire way to completely fail to produce any type of result that you're defining. Uh, back, back to the business, thank you, yep. Tim. Back to the business, how do you feel about free, uh, free, free versus paying? Uh, like, like, you know, uh, take Google. Yep. <laughs> like, just take a huge <laughs> example like of Facebook. Small example. Yeah, or Facebook right. or YouTube. Right. They would have never got to such a size mm -hmm. if they had started charging immediately, and they still don't, right? Right. right. And, and, and on the, so that's one kind of culture way to launch mm -hmm. things on the web is right. everything free, which is what we're doing right now, and right. hoping that one day you can either have a pro version, freemium, or have some advertising. That's mm -hmm. one way. Mm -hmm. The other way is to make everything paying since the beginning. Right. Uh, how do you feel about that? Because you're an angel, so you, right. you must advise your yeah. investments, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. so I, I have about half a dozen investments right now, uh, and a number of them are in the freemium model, where they have the, the free version, and then they have either one paid version or multiple paid versions. Uh, there are, I guess there is, think about this, there is, I think, one company that is free only at the moment. Uh, all the others, and then there is one that is paid only. And they have a number of options, but it's paid only. There is no free option. And I think it depends a lot on uh, a few things. Number one, the <laughs> cash reserves. Yep. Do you have the cash to survive a worst case scenario? Yep. If you don't, that is a problem. Uh, so I, I like to believe, and I think this is very much in line with Warren Buffett and, Char and Charlie Munger as well, is if, as long as you limit your downside and you have a margin of error, then or a, a margin of safety, then you, the upside will tend to take care of itself. Uh, the other thing is what you want your company to become. So for some people who are watching this or listening to this, 
they want to have a venture-backed startup, or at least angel-backed startup, that'll have an exit in the form of an acquisition uh, or an IPO. Uh, in this market, probably acquisition. Um, and in that case, reaching a certain critical mass and scale is very important uh, because a, a 2x return is not satisfactory for <laughs> any VC that I know, certainly. I mean, they're looking for a certain internal rate of return. Uh, so you need the, the, the potential for 20, 30, 40x for a lot of these people to invest in the first place. So you have a financial obligation to your investors. Uh, for those which requires size. Which requires size. And the easiest way to get, one of the easiest way to get size is to give away what you do for free. Uh, because it removes one of the biggest barriers to entry, which is price. It's like if Twitter ch started charging right now, I would yeah. pay, yeah. but they wouldn't grow as fast. Right, right exactly. So, the, the, so and, and that brings up the point, and that we don't have to go too far into this, but is, it's not how you, then you have two sets of metrics. You have the metrics that you use, and then you have the metrics of your, that your potential acquirers use to determine the valuation of a company. And those are not always the same thing. So... <laughs> Uh, that turns into a much bigger conversation. But like, if you're going to be, if it's a private equity firm, that's different from a strategic purchaser, and it gets very interesting. Um, for a lot of people listening, they might just say, you know what, I don't need to have an IPO or a venture-backed company. All I want is to make what I'm making now, but have control of my time. In that case, uh, I think it's extremely important, certainly if you're not depending on someone else's bankroll, um, to test. Uh, paid product from the very outset uh, and to have live and die uh, by, uh, by positive or negative cash flow. So from the very outset, I've never taken outside funding for my own companies. So you have I, never? Never. So I think that... Why not? Uh, because I felt confident that I could do the micro testing early on so that I could generate revenue from day and one. You don't want to bother with uh, partners and uh, I, no, a stockholder, I, shareholders? Not at this point. I mean, I think that there's, some, there's a certain sex appeal to having a you know real company and having a capitalization table and having investors and this and that like I'm not gonna lie I mean even that there is some attraction to that even for me like to have some really kick-ass investors and you know not to say that I could do this but I mean if you can slap the name Kleiner Perkins or Coastal Ventures on your website yeah that's cool it's really cool but there are a lot of responsibilities that come with that um, and for most people if they're looking at not a uh, not building an enterprise not building a a, a mass scale business, then you're looking at effectively a lifestyle business or a lifestyle design, in which case uh, you really need to understand cash flow and um, whether you reinvest capital or deploy it elsewhere. Uh, there's an excellent book uh, on uh, reading financial statements. Uh, actually, uh, I think Warren Buffett wrote the introduction, which I would recommend all entrepreneurs read. Learn to read financial statements, extremely important. Cool. Um, you're a business angel, so so you don't take outside investment, but you're you're investing yourself. Can, can uh, they well, pitch you here? Uh, uh, sure, they're happy. Yeah, they're they're welcome you to, take, to pitch you, me. You take business, you take business plans, and uh, I generally well, the best way to pitch me is to go through somebody I know, uh, just okay. because of the the volume of deal so flow. Go for me. Yeah, go through, go through me. <laughs> uh, I'm already getting like ten a day, so that's fine. I'll but, send them all to you. So there are a couple of things just for entrepreneurs who are looking for investment. A few things you need to do. Uh, and if you have the chance to look at, for example, the Y Combinator Demo Day uh, presentations, take a look because they're, they're, they tend to be very well coached. Uh, first of all, what's the problem? How are you fixing it? Um, how much money do you need? Where is that money going to go? What is your business model? And then what are the, what are the numbers, what are the metrics that you're, you are measuring? And what do they look like? You have to show some traction. Um, not revenue projections, because it's all going to be BS, generally speaking. Um, those are a few of the things that are very important. Uh, and then to really point out why you are better than the competition. So take a second in your presentation and say, I just want to take a moment to emphasize why we are so unique as compared to A, B, and C. I mean, really lay it out and, and uh, handhold people when you're explaining these things. And you want like 50 slides or? <laughs> yeah, 300, 400 <laughs> slides. Uh, very short. I mean, it should be. One pager? Ten, yeah, one page or 10 slides. I see some people really sacrifice important data when they try to limit it to one page. But uh, I mean, 10 slides or if it's text, two to three pages. Uh, you you want to have the chance, if, if there are people involved, to give brief snapshots of their bios and so forth. And that's a three quarter page. Uh, right there. Uh, what, what's, what's exciting? What are the cool, like, 
either advice you can give uh, where to start a business these days mm -hmm. that you think is, are exciting or where you would like consider investing your money and your time and helping? Sure. So the, the uh, number one, don't go looking for money with a concept uh, in, or an idea. Unless you are someone who's already done it successfully a few times, um, you need to show some traction. And there's really no excuse not to if it is, let's say, uh, a consumer-facing web application. Uh, I mean, go, go rent storage or, or servers from Amazon or someone else and get a prototype up and running so mm -hmm. you can show people what it looks like. You need it, at the very least, you need screenshots and to show people what the mock-up would look like. Uh, but I don't invest in anything unless it's showing some degree of okay. traction. So you want um, a prototype walking? Yep. As far as things that are interesting, um, this is going to sound like um, beating a dead horse here, but uh, better ways of measuring things that matter. Okay. So, um, so Rescue Time would be one example. There's another company I just invested in that we'll be announcing shortly. Uh, sm smart data. So if, if I can go to Rescue Time as one example, uh, and without really any data entry, let it track what I'm doing, and then point out where I'm wasting time and where I'm spending my time most effectively, and then to set, set thresholds on the things that I'm wasting time on or even block sites, hmm. that is very valuable. It doesn't just, and this is the problem with a lot of analytics programs, uh, you'll look at, let's say, certain plugins for WordPress, and the analytics is just a page of 70 metrics. I don't, that makes my job harder to do. It doesn't help me. I don't want to have to try to correlate 70 different data points. Um, so those types of tools are very interesting. Uh, anything uh, physical performance related or biometric related, I'm very fascinated by. Like, so, like, like body, body performance. Yeah, body performance. So for example, um, just before the last iPhone version came out, I was doing research to find, try to find a glucometer that you could attach to an iPhone. Uh, so something to, to measure your blood glucose uh, that could attach to an iPhone. Why would you want to do that? Uh, I might not want to. Well, I do because I'm compulsive about looking at how different, uh, different foods affect my blood sugar uh, for performance purposes, weight training, and, and so forth. But uh, very useful for, let's say, diabetics. So if you have 30 million iPhone users and you can develop a, not a dongle because that's too much of a pain in the ass, but something very simple that's small that attaches to the bottom of an iPhone so you can not only take your blood uh, glucose measurement, that's easy, but so that that is automatically fed into a web app that then shows you exactly how it tracks and which foods you're consuming. Mm -hmm. That is very interesting. So minimizing basically any tracking device, hardware and software, that removes the need for data entry. That's very interesting to me. And linked to your health and your body and yep. what you eat. Exactly. And, uh, exactly. Especially in the US. A, it's a huge opportunity. In Japan, they have this uh, bathroom right, where you do your thing and you get an analysis. Really? Yeah. Wait, what is it? It's it's, a, uh, you, you go to a, sorry guys, you go to a bathroom and uh, yeah. And uh, it, uh, it's, it's like urine time. analysis or something? Yeah, yeah, it analyzes your body. Well, maybe, you know, I, sh maybe like I should be investing in Japan. <laughs> Startups well, right yeah. here are expensive. The pre-money valuations here are expensive. <laughs> maybe I'll go to Japan. This interview will never end, someone is asking. Um, and we have 160 uh, friends here talking and m many more there uh, because we'll post it as well. Mm -hmm. Community, do you think, um, so how do you, you have a community team, mm -hmm. which is huge. How many books did you have, like copies circulating? How many readers do you think of your book? Uh, the numbers I know uh, are the, the book's in its 41st printing in the US. Uh, there, that means that there are more than 700,000 copies uh, in print in the US. Most of those have been sold because uh, Crown, my publisher, does very short print runs. Uh, it's been sold into 34 markets, so I think that makes it about between 32 and 30 or 33 languages. Uh, so it's a few million people. Yep. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very popular book in the library system. Uh, there's generally, in, in most major cities, there's a, a wait list of 10 to 20 people to get copies of the book, which is really um, amazing. I mean, I'm did very- Did you expect that much success when no, you wrote it? No, no, I didn't expect the success, but I did plan for it in the sense that I didn't, ex I went in planning for, hoping for the best, but planning for the worst. And that also entails planning for the best, meaning that I set the conditions so that it would have the highest probability of success, but I didn't expect it because you have more than 200,000 books a year that are published in the US alone. And I mean, fewer than 5% sell more than 5,000 copies or reach break even for their advances. So the, 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 the 
the statistics, the probabilities are, are against you in that case. So, so but, that's a great way to start a community. You right. know, he's write a fantastic book, which is yeah. not easy. <laughs> you should yeah. teach us how to do that. Well, I mean, also, but the point, the point that you allude to, which is important, is that I timed, I launched my blog several months before the book came out. So I used the two of them in combination to feed off of each other and to build that community. And I've had many authors uh, approach me and ask me how to set up a blog. Number one, I ask them, you know, do you enjoy writing? Uh, if you don't, don't bother. Because a, a, a mediocre blog is more of a liability than no blog at all. Like a mediocre blog is worse than having no blog. Yeah. So don't have a crappy blog. Uh, second is if you're an author and you have a book coming out in six months, I would encourage you to try to time the promotion of the blog with the book. It just makes the job much easier. And that could also be the launch of a new version of a product. But really try to time these initiatives so that they coincide with one another. Um, secondly is there, there are a number of phases in building a community. I think the first is creating a first, first wave of early adopters, which I think I did fairly effectively by giving a keynote presentation at South by Southwest in 2007. That's really where... So before your book Before the book out? came out. This was a month before the book came out. And that was really, I would say, the first tipping point. And you were not known at that time? Not at all. Not no. at all or not too much already? Uh, a little very bit? little. I mean, How did you get that? You called them and like, can I do a keynote? Uh, <laughs> I had to, well, <laughs> leaving out the details, it took, it took a lot of effort because uh, they're, I mean, they're inundated with requests. I was introduced to one of the organizers okay. of South by Southwest. And, um, and uh, they want the details. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, so, you, you so, knew someone. Yeah, 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 but no, 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 no. So anyway, uh, so I did South by Southwest. It was, it was being a pain in the ass, guys, is what it was. It was calling, emailing, and doing it intermittently so you don't seem like a stalker, but it was not easy. I mean, I had to persist and, and consistently give new reasons for contacting them and new information. It was a pain in the ass, so that's the way it goes. Um, so, so show up at the events in general. Right, right. Well, I did the event. The timing's important. I did the event a month before the book came out. The blog was already pre-existing, had some content on it so people could link to it, all right, which would build. Ah, so you, okay. you, you think a lot in like, I, wow. Yeah, I was yeah. thinking about So I had the anchor text okay. for certain topics and terms linking back to my blog before the book came out. Then, How many people in the room? There were about 150, but it's, here's the thing. Who, who reads your stuff or who listens to you is more important than how many. So I, I would rather take 150 bloggers in one room almost any day, even if they're not A-list bloggers. That's almost, what we have now, so 170. Yeah, yeah great. Then, then speaking, let's say, doing a, an article for a regional newspaper that has perhaps 5,000 readers that'll hit that page. There are also too many steps between the newspaper and, and linking back. And unless you may online. not care too much, whereas at South yep. By and other conferences, people right. are really engaged. Yeah, and, and tailor, tailor your message. This is very important. So what I didn't do, so I had South by Southwest. Then before the book came out, I was already developing relationships with bloggers, and I'm still friends with them to this day. It wasn't like I was using them on a one-off transaction. Um, and they had individual content. It wasn't like I said, here's a book, review the book. Uh, they did get, re get uh, pre-release copies, but uh, I was doing Q&As, guest posts on very specific topics that that were not in the book for the most part, because I, what I wanted people to, to, I wanted people to believe in uh, m my credibility first and foremost, and then to bring them to the blog second. Uh, that's very important. Uh, if, if people don't believe the messenger, it does not matter how good your message is. So a blog, a conference appearance very early on, yep. a great book, that's not that easy. And then giving them tools so that they can be the force multiplier for the next wave of followers and the next wave of followers. So I had vBulletin, the forum, yeah. set up uh, well before the book launched. Um, not only that, but I encouraged people. For example, I said, look, guys, I'm never going to create the four-hour work week for the, the Christian single mother with diabetes soul. Like, it's not going to happen. So if, if that's your demographic and you want to create a community, here's how you do it very early on, I think this was within the first two weeks, I said, go to Ning, go to Ning.com. This is exactly how you do it. This is how you tag it and create your own community. And do so, you have one in Ning? Uh, I don't have one because I want them to uh, be self-supporting. But there are uh, at least yeah. 12, maybe 20. 
uh, for different demographics. So there's four-hour work week for writers, four-hour work week for this, four-hour work week for that. And uh, well, you do cinema also. You invited us to um, uh, oh, right, watch right. a movie, uh, yeah. right, a few months ago. Yeah, you uh, packed an entire uh, movie theater. Movie theater, yeah, for the James Bond premiere, and uh, it was a lot of fun. It was not expensive. Uh, I did that with American Apparel, so they sponsored the event. There was a party beforehand for uh, I guess about 50 people, and then rented out the entire theater for a James Bond film. And Great way to put people together. Right. So as I recognize how fortunate I am to have the readers that I do. And I want to give back when I can. Uh, and there are a number of ways to do that. I mean, just this week, I sent out. Uh, so give uh, back to your community. Yeah, I mean, just, all the time. just this week on Twitter. So I do, I do use Twitter yeah, we'll for very specific ways. But I sent out coupons for donorschoose.org. Check it out. Donorschoose.org is one of the, uh, the nonprofits that I'm on the advisory board of. Uh, I sent out about $90,000 worth of coupons for people to go to Donors Choose and donate to classrooms in their, in their hometowns or in their areas that, that need the funding for basic materials like books and blackboards and things like that. Um, so there, there are a lot, but the other thing that is important about community is I don't, I, 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 I certainly value passive readers, but I, I also want my readers to be very action oriented because it's very easy to read advice and not apply it. It's very Can you e d d define that? So what that means is I, I will constantly try to get my readers engaged with doing small things that benefit them, that benefit other, other people. And over time, what you find is this becomes a habit, whether that's a philanthropic habit or any other habit that people can then put on autopilot. And I've been doing that since the very beginning. So my readers are very active. I mean, I was in Vietnam uh, just a few weeks ago with Matt Mullenweg and a few other people. Two of the people I was with were readers who had donated to this school. We built two schools in Vietnam. And they flew all the way to Vietnam to see these schools, um, uh, Andrew Rosca um, and Jose Castro. And that, I don't think that would have happened had I not led up to that with many small opportunities to get engaged and, and to be, be involved with something bigger than themselves. Um, that's, I, th I think, a very critical portion of having a community. You want an active community. You don't want, you, you don't want a community that metaphorically is going to see somebody getting stabbed in the street and let it go on for 15 minutes before they call the cops if they do it all, um, which is actually a real story. It's terrible stuff. But you, you want a community that's going to be really engaged. Twitter. How do you use Twitter? How does Tip Ferris use Twitter? I use Twitter uh, very, in very specific ways. Number one is for uh, effectively an online diary, really, to just chronicle the things that I think are cool or things that have happened to me so I can look back and check it out. Um, second is uh, I blog quite infrequently by most standards, so once or twice a week. Um, often less frequently. So for the people who want the small things that I think are cool, that are not worth an entire blog post, because I don't want to clog people's RSS readers either, uh, then they can follow me on Twitter. And they'll see what I'm doing, the music that I find that I think is cool. Or T Ferris, uh, double R, double S. You got it, yeah. Ev, I need, I need Timothy. At Timothy, please. Anyway, um, <laughs> so T Ferris, yeah, with two R's, two S's. Um, and that's pretty much it. It's a, it is really a microblogging tool for me. Small things that I find of interest and uh, that I think could be helpful. I also poll my Twitter followers quite a lot. So if I'm looking at e-commerce, simple e-commerce platforms like Shopify.com or e-commerce plugins for WordPress or other options, I will ask them and poll them which they find most useful if they have any other suggestions. And then I'll report the findings back to those followers. Mm. Do you auto-follow everyone? No, I don't auto-follow. Why not? It would make them happy. Uh, it would, maybe. I, I don't want it to make them happy. I, I, in this, in the, it's not that I don't want to make my readers happy. I want them to get uh, fulfillment out of other things. Um, Auto-following also, as you know, creates a lot of problems with bots and spam and, dire and yeah. direct messages. Um, and I, I don't, stopped I, doing it. So and I don't need that. Like, Facebook, to me, already turned into a huge mess because of all the spam and so forth by auto-approving friends. And I don't but want you see, like, like some people, like, like, like Kawasaki, are saying, "Oh, it's arrogant. You're an arrogant because you're following few people." And well, you know, auto follow. Yeah. People can define. I'm teasing. I have no yeah, answer to no, this. No, no, no. I mean, I think that if everybody agreed on everything, it would be a very boring world. But the idea that you're arrogant if you don't engage with everybody who wants to engage with you. Come on. Uh, that if you want to spend all of your time responding to everybody who wants something or anything or nothing at all, just wants to chat with you about the rapture or whatever, then hey, that's your choice. But I don't think it's arrogant. Uh, I think saying, you know what, I want you to actually 
get offline for at least a few hours a day and do something that's meaningful for you, uh, I don't think that's arrogant. I think that's trying to be helpful. But How about Facebook? Uh, Facebook, for me, was sort of a great idea in the beginning. Allowed uh, old friends to find me and uh, just became very unwieldy once there was a certain critical mass of people who had been approved. Uh, because uh, it's very easy to hurt feelings on Facebook or on Twitter. Because Facebook, you also like you have to reciprocate, right? It's a friend, a friend <sighs> on Facebook is yeah. we both friend each other. Yeah, exactly. So if you meet someone at a party and then they ask for yeah, and you they to friend them, and it's not like you dislike them, so you don't want so to say same, no. You feel bad. There's a certain, uh, certainly a certain amount of guilt associated with that. Uh, so there was a, a point of no return, which was probably about a year and a half for me. And so, so you've um, not friended everyone on Facebook? Either. No, I do. I you do. do. I do because I'm just past the point of no return. I think that oh. in that case, it's either you keep it very, very tight, or you oh. friend everybody. And I'm already past the point of no return, so I friend, I, I friend everybody. Um, but and, it's okay. So you and, I, I, and I do post to Facebook. I do. I have photos and so forth up there. But I, I try to minimize the the number of sites I have to interface with. So I use stuff like Ping. Ping.fm. I think is a great tool. Yeah, very badass. Yeah. yeah as they uh, auto de 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 describe themselves. <laughs> Sean, if you watch this. Uh, and, and the video, you don't do much video, right? You do video when you uh, have people inviting you, uh, but you don't do your, your own, like Gary Vaynerchuk, like every other day. Not, not every other day. I do video. I, I think video is great. Uh, I think it's, it, it really brings in an audience that may not otherwise engage with you also. Uh, so I very rarely do video only posts because I think that online, at least in my experience, nothing travels faster than text. So mm. um, I like to combine video with text. Like today's post on, I just put up a post uh, earlier today on how to use chopsticks, which was a video clip from, from Vietnam because everybody has trouble with chopsticks unless they grew up with them just about. Um, and that's that, cool. Yeah, so and that's, you do and that's funny video. videos like these. I, I do. I mean, the, 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 the videos that I uh, put the most thought into generally get the least number the, the fewest <laughs> views and and the one the one video that has the most views it has something like two and a half million views. what is it it's how to uh, peel hard-boiled eggs without peeling them it's basically <laughs> cooking them with baking soda and then pinching off a hole at either end and holding it and then blowing the egg out into your other hand and this video is one take with my brother 60 seconds and it has you know two and a half million views yeah, so. you never know what works or not yeah. online, right it's very hard to predict anything else you do with your community do you do meetups I do meetups. Uh, like you go to I, Vietnam and you say. Yeah, you know. I did a meetup in Vietnam. I did. Uh, I I also hold parties for my my readers. I mean, in like in London, rented out a big space uh, and had a party, maybe two hundred something people. Uh, in Madrid, did that as well. Sydney did that as well. Paris this year. Paris could be fun. I need some help. I don't speak like French. In December, for example. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I'll need some help setting it up since I don't speak. Uh, I will help. I I don't speak a Francais. <laughs> Cool. So yeah, that was a community. Now, how how can we live your uh, Tim Ferriss life? What is the Tim Ferriss life? Because look, you're yeah. so cool. Can you show your shoes? Like, yeah, I'm gonna help you. Yeah. So you can see the fingers here. Yeah. Uh, are <laughs> and these are like. So how do you get to? Uh, these are like what? Uh, what um, like kite surfing or something? Uh, so these, yeah. Can you see them so the, well? So the Vibram, <laughs> the Vibram five finger shoes. <laughs> are, are a major part of my life. No, um, they're, they're fun shoes. They make, they, make, they make the metatarsal ligaments and muscles stronger in your feet. So you can do all sorts of cool things once you actually make your feet strong. Uh, but oh, really? I, I, yeah. You I, try to move all the fingers? Uh, no, just by walking with these with shoes. Toes, I mean. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, cool. Improves your pressing strength. For those of you guys out there who want to increase your, your overhead pressing strength, you can usually get another. Uh, 10 to 15 percent out of your pressing strength if you make your feet really strong. It's a long conversation, but anyway. So what's your life like? So because you're <coughs> saying you have no appointment, you have no, right. you have a virtual assistant. We have to talk about that. Right. You have, uh, you know, you 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 live the best life, right? You uh, travel I mean, I, all the time. I I live a. Uh, I never work. That's so. This comes. I think this brings up the the crux definition, right? So what is work? And there are a lot of uh, sort of ankle biters out there like, ah, Tim Ferriss de defines work any way he wants. So, you know, of course he can say he's not working if he defines it a certain way. That's not true. I mean, I've defined work in the context of the book very clearly since day one. And that is something that you either uh, do primarily uh, for financial reasons uh, or something you'd prefer to do less of. So there are meaning, meaning that there are teachers, there are pastors, there are uh, many people, entrepreneurs, who love what they do, but they don't 
there's a point where it becomes unmanageable and unsustainable at 80, 100 hours. So how do you cut it back to a point where you get the best results for your, your invested time? Um, so the one thing that I do not promote is idleness. Uh, I really think uh, that you should make mistakes of ambition and not mistakes of sloth. So I am, by any conventional measurement, very, very active. I mean, I'm meeting with uh, a number of people today, a few startups, and uh, You're saying it's I'm invest. Is the video freeze there? No, it, looks, it doesn't yeah. look like. Okay. Uh, what I promote is valuing time as the most valuable non-renewable currency and recognizing that income without time has no value. And once you do that... Income without time? Uh, income without time has no value. Because mm -hmm. income is really... Income has no intrinsic value. It is... The value that it has is what you can trade it for. And even if what you trade it for is a possession, ultimately what you're looking for is an experience. And without time, there's no experience. So uh, if you want to read more about stuff like that, pick up Seneca, Letters from a Stoic. Uh, Epicurus, also pretty good. Um, most, a lot of the reading that I do is very, very old. Uh, wait, wait, on this one I have a quote for you from your book. Doing something unimportant well does not make it important. Right. Very, <laughs> very important cool. distinction. So doing something well does not make it... Doing something unimportant well does not make it important. Also, doing something that takes a lot of time does not make it important. Yeah. Um, and uh, so my life right now, just to cut back, uh, is, is not just sitting on a beach rubbing cocoa butter on my stomach all day. Um, I have a lot of things I want to accomplish in this lifetime, and for the purposes of, uh, of that, I assume this is my one, one trip, so to speak. Uh, talk about reincarnation some other time, maybe. But um, <laughs> so I, I'm very engaged. It's just I have the freedom to choose what I allocate my time to. And uh, I think that is, is extremely important, and it's easier to do than most people realize. Uh, you have a choice. I can't quit my job. I'll get fired. I can't do this. I'll get fired. You have a choice. Uh, I mean, outside of, outside of the law and the natural uh, sciences, it, most of reality is negotiable. And a lot of people who are getting laid off right now are actually yep. taking that opportunity to say, you know what, let me take a step back. I'll go to Argentina, Berlin, somewhere, decompress for a few months, and actually rethink what it is that I want to do, you know, who it is that I want to spend my time with. So I, I think that this recession is actually a great opportunity for some people to take a step back and ask themselves, questions that seem hypothetical but might not be like, what if I can't ever retire? How do my decisions change if the objective isn't retirement and 401k? And I think for anyone who uh, has a type A personality, you're not going to retire. I've, I've seen people try. It doesn't work. They take two days off and then they're off to something else. I mean, you look at entrepreneurs in the valley. I mean, how many of them, they've, they've, they've made as much money as they'll ever need many times over. They're still creating. I mean, yeah, you're not burning yourself much money. That's also one of the things you yeah. over and over. You, you, you live cheap and you just uh, like enjoy. You don't want employees. You don't want like yeah. too much. You don't like luxury too much. Right. You just, you know. And that's, and that's also a big part of it. And this is, this is really borrowed directly from, from Seneca and Epictetus and a few other philosophers is it's not because you want to take this moral high ground and say that you prefer this ascetic, hard lifestyle of bread and, 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 and flip-flops and nothing else. It's not that. It's you practice that so that you don't fear it. And once you don't fear that, then all of a sudden you have a lot more options and you have, uh, you have the wherewithal in the stomach to make really terrifying decisions or decisions that would be very terrifying for other people. Once you don't fear it and you're like, yeah, this isn't that bad. I can actually do really well with this as long as I have a cheap bottle of wine and a few friends to have dinner with, you know, things really aren't that bad. Then it gives you the freedom to make decisions about changing jobs, starting companies, closing down companies, things like that that you otherwise wouldn't have. Wow. Yeah. Wow. It's been, uh, it's been uh, 40, a good 40 minutes. So we'll take like a few questions uh, from mm -hmm. there and then you keep can keep, you know, of course we will post this on, 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 on Seismic 2 and mm -hmm. we'll post it on YouTube as well so you can uh, all find it. But like, let's see, do you have a... I'll, I'll yeah, let you Loic, TV, exactly. I'll let you choose the questions. Uh, yeah, do you guys have uh, questions here? The shoes. <laughs> oh yeah, why do you wear orange all the time? <laughs> uh, I like bright colors. Uh, this actually came about when uh, a friend of mine, AJ Jacobs, who's a editor at um, 
at large at Esquire magazine wrote a book called My Year of Living Biblically. And we tried to follow all the, the rules in the Bible for one year, which is extremely, extremely impossible to do. Uh, but he, he, he really gave it a good shot. And one of the things he did is he wore white uh, linen almost all the time. And he said that one of the greatest things he took out of that entire experiment was wearing white. And he just found that it made him, it, it just improved his mood tremendously. To See, wear orange? Well, not, not orange, but to wear something other than black. Uh, for, for many years, I just found that black and gray, they just they matched with anything they were easier, boring. easier to wear. Um, so I like orange, I like green. I don't wear just orange, but today I happen to be wearing orange. Um, you can see I, I need a stylist. I have, I have burgundy and then blue <laughs> shoes with, with fingers on them, so I, I wouldn't you, take You my, have to tell us where we, sh we can find those shoes. Vibrant. Uh, yeah, so Vibram. Uh, Vibram. Vibram oh. shoes. Oh. <laughs> v All right. V I B R A M. Very pop. They actually make, uh, they, they started out making soles for hiking boots and other shoes. And uh, just, I guess I'm guessing vibram.com, but you can, you can check them out. So there are a few questions on your virtual assistant. Uh, um, Postress.com, what's my relationship with them? I'm, I'm an investor, so I help them with uh, mostly um, UI design, conversions from the homepage to sign up, and uh, also talking about all the usual things you'd expect, monetization strategy and things like that. Do you still use a virtual assistant? Do you still have one? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah where I, where I, is she or he? Uh, my main virtual assistant is on an island off of Vancouver. <laughs> So I was actually, oh, really? yeah, I was actually visiting Vancouver because she said she was around Vancouver, and I was like, oh, you know, maybe we should meet up for coffee. And she's like, well, I'm actually, you'd have to take a two-hour boat ride. <laughs> so uh, that's where she is. And then I have uh, for for lower-level tasks, I actually use a company called Ask Sunday. So AskSunday.com, and they're the uh, the only VA service besides my um, my Canadian assistant that I have on speed dial. You can call them up. They have all my 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 data on file. Call them up, give them something to do takes 30 seconds and they'll either email it to me or call me back. You have to manage the, the assistant, you see what I mean? You have to think about what you give them and so on. Well, yeah, I mean, you do, but this is no different from having an employee. So, I mean, it's exactly the same. So, if there's something that you can do, like go into orbits, or I'll give you an example of where this is valuable. Because people might say, well, you know, I can go on to orbits and I can get my flight in two minutes, why should I pay somebody to do that? The reason you should pay someone to do that is because the cost of interrupting an important task is not just those two or three minutes. This is especially clear with something like writing, where if I take myself out of that writing groove, it can take me 30 minutes to get back to where I was. Uh, but that's certainly also true if you're working on some Which really... Which is one of your big advice is, is don't multitask. Yeah. Don't, I mean, really be extremely focused. Don't read chat rooms while you talk to someone. Right, right. <laughs> don't alt-tab to, to I am 70 times a day, which is apparently the average. Don't tweet. Down. Don't read tweets all day long? Not all day long. Yeah, take, take a break. Even if you single task for short periods, 20 to 30 minutes at a time. Uh, I mean, really use something uh, like a countdown timer. Like I think it's egg timer is the one I tend to use. Uh, it's, I think it's egg dot timer, eg dot g timer. Uh, it's neat. Check it out. They're asking how much uh, you're paying your virtual assistant. Can you say this or maybe not? Yeah, yeah, not I can say it. I, I'm, okay, yeah, I'm, uh, yeah, yeah, that's fine. So I, I'm actually paying her about uh, somewhere between 25, I think it's 25 to 30 an hour, um, which is it's not cheap. I mean, that, that adds up. If she's full time, that's about $60,000, $50,000 to $60,000 a year. But you could um, have one in, uh, you know, cheaper labor cost country, right? Oh, yeah, I could. Uh, now, I don't, I don't use uh, my assistant in Canada full time also, uh, but I use her for very language sensitive tasks like email. And she, the reason that I pay her so much also is that she, all, she subcontracts out to virtual assistants who cost less for specific types of repetitive tasks. So what I'm actually paying for is that entire org chart, not just her. She's like my uh, COO of some, of some type, <laughs> my personal COO. Cool. Well, Tim, we'll, uh, we have uh, only a few minutes left to actually have lunch. Yeah. And you know, I'm European, so I like two-hour lunches, so we won't be able to make a two-hour lunch. I know, we we'll need to cram it in. But, you know, I think it was good to uh, have your, your community and our community here around. So thanks very much for all your uh, time. And uh, yeah, let, let's, let's, have, let's have lunch. Thank you, guys. You know, 240 people in the room right now. That's what I like is, you, you know, you can imagine the room and then we'll get thousands more on, on, on our uh, platforms, Facebook and YouTube and so on. So that's very cool. Thank you very much, guys. Thanks, guys. For coming.